Hello, thanks for joining us for another system design mock interview. Uh, first, just a quick reminder, if you are preparing for an interview, then do check out our platform, igotanoffer.com, where you can find prep materials and you can also get one-to-one -one coaching with ex-FANG interviewers to help you nail the interview and get that job. Uh, okay, my candidate today was hired by Google after he was top coder of the month on algorithm track of top coder. He also scored in the top 50 in the final round of Google Code Jam. Um, and since then, he's done all sorts of things. He's become one of the most interesting people online talking about system design and related topics. Um, he's also a host of the YouTube channel Sys Design Meetup, which you are welcome to get involved in yourself. Um, let's bring him on. Dima, thank you so much for doing this interview with us today. Good to be here. Thank you, Tom. I'll do a lot and I derive tons of pleasure and satisfaction from having people become better engineers and pass interviews with plain colors. So let's record this. Yeah, great. Thanks for doing this. And uh, yeah, Dima is going to um, play the role of the candidate, but um, he he loves kind of helping people get better interviews and get better at system design, first and foremost. Um, so he will kind of step out of character at some points during the interview and to give you tips on on uh, what kind of considerations you should be you should be making. Um, okay, that sound about right. Anything you want to add or should we crack straight on? Excited. Let's Let's do it. Okay. Well, Dima, um, the question I wanted to ask you today is how would you design Uber? All right. Well, we start from certain requirements to make sure we're solving the same problem. Um, usually in an interview, there's a section called FRs and non-FRs, functional and non-functional requirements. First, and I don't necessarily like these terms that much, but they do help. So let's, let's talk about what we need to solve for. Let's first not forget that Uber is a two-sided marketplace. So we have uh, riders, they book rides. Um, basically, if I'm a rider, I am at point A, or I plan to be at point A right now, sometime soon, maybe in the future. And what I do is I use the app to call a cab, to call a car, call a taxi, or call an Uber, to get from certain point B, from A to B, now or later. Um, there also are the drivers, which is a totally different part of the conversation, because Uber, again, is a two-sided marketplace, so there are no um, let's put aside the conversation about contractors versus full-time employees. Basically, we, we're going to like not touch regulation. Uh, we got a bunch of people who have signed up for the platform so that they can be given rights. I assume they passed all the background checks and they are allowed to do so. And they also have the app open. They do drive people from A to B. Um, and uh, so to me, the most interesting part of Uber is how to how to connect these two, because solving for only only this, only riders or only drivers, is not as fun as doing the whole thing as closing the loop. But for the sake of completeness, let's talk about what the riders can do. Um, well, book a ride from use a GPS, of course, from the way uh, so that I can book the ride from where I am right now or from a given point, provided point. Uh, I can uh, set custom time. I can change the right midway. I can cancel it before or midway. There are tons of issues to worry about when it comes to, like if it's an airport transfer or pickup, certain pickup points, uh, proper terminal locations, if there is a parking lot to enter. Uh, that's a big problem itself. Uh, I'm not sure we need to go there, but I need to, I need to put it here. Pick up, drop off points. A lot to be honest, this would be shared requirements. Uh, and also the important thing here is that we have ratings. 
Um, and when I provide a write, so the way it works, I think, is uh, when I'm the writer, when I'm the driver, I start my day, I start my shift or whatnot. I, I'm back in business after lunch. And uh, I open the app and I mark myself as, as available, which, which is kind of my first requirement, right? Out of business, on hold. And then what needs to happen is Uber as a company doesn't request rights. Other writers do. So what happens when I'm marking myself as, as available, uh, I'm going to start receiving, I'm going to call them bids. The requests to be, the request from a particular writer to be taken from point A to point B. I should also add here that uh, we have different car types. X, black, uh, large, and uh, pets or whatnot, children. And I should also add that uh, number of people can be different. So as a, as a writer, of course, I, I mark myself available in a particular car. The system knows that. The system knows I'm driving like a Mercedes-Benz E-Class, which means I can take, let's say, up to four people. And as a driver, people. you mean? All this. Yeah. As a, apologies, as a driver. As a driver. Yes. Yeah, you need and to just change that. As a, it says rider. Just for... Oh, thank you. Just not to confuse the viewers, yeah. You are absolutely right. So... Do not confuse the viewers. Writers. Drivers. So what happens with... There's a, there's a separate conversation behind the scenes that has to do with, with the price, uh, price creation. Uh, we need to, need to talk about this eventually. I don't think it's the time is right now, but there is a, there is a price. It's in the shared requirements. Price setting engine plus search pricing. Search pricing is a very clever idea. It's that if we have a hot marketplace, if if it's Christmas or if it's some I don't know large sport sport event, uh, because we have so many so much more riders than drivers, the price gets higher so that the the drivers make extra money and uh, the market works out this thing. But from what I understand, from what I know, Uber by design does not let people bid on prices. Uber sets the price itself. So it's other platforms. Other platform, platforms probably let you like put the amount as the as the rider and potentially as the driver until the orders match, like in the order book. But with Uber, it's it's fixed price computed by the platform given the current conditions. Uh, what's important here is that when I am the driver and I, and I receive the bid, I'm not entirely positive. I've not. It's, it's been a while since I've seen this interface from the inside, but I don't think the driver knows a lot about the right. Because I think from the product perspective, there used to be, uh, there was a failure mode when if you want to go to a certain region where drivers don't want to go to, you cannot order a, order a car there, order an Uber there. So I think what they would tell you as a driver is you need to pick up somebody at a certain point. It's going to be on the map on your phone. So I know how far, how far it is. Chances are it's going to be sent to me while I'm driving a current passenger. So that Uber as a platform really wants their drivers to be driving full time. So when I'm completing the ride, my phone will start buzzing me with potential options. And I think, I don't think it's going to tell me where uh, is the next potential rider going, but it's going to tell me if it's a short ride or a long ride. And I also think there's a big important feature, which was ultimately introduced and people loved it. Drivers loved it when they can mark themselves as going home. So that on the one hand, you cannot. I'm sort of making this up, but it's fun. On the one hand, I mean, I, I, I have some, I have some knowledge, but I'm also making educated guesses. The way it works is on the one hand, you don't want to penalize the riders who go to the, to the area where drivers don't want to go. That would be embarrassing and insane. So the way it works is we, the platform 
Uber, the platform, does not tell the driver that this potential customer, potential rider, wants to go to a certain region they don't want to go to. But at the same time, when it's like late in my shift and I probably plan to be going home, I can hint the platform that, hey, I would much rather be going towards that direction. So if I'm living in a town and I'm like north of it, because that's where the airport is, I can probably start marking myself as, please take me to the right home, but not vice versa. So I'm heading home. Right. Um, yeah. So receive pickup location time most often now. Um, how long the ride is planned to be, or how far. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. How many people? Maybe. Doesn't matter. But not too much. All right. So now, if this makes sense, I think it mostly does so far. Um, let's talk about what we're actually optimizing for. This for functional requirements. Um, I think the way I would put it, non-functional requirements. My goal, the objective, is to keep the riders, uh, the drivers busy. Oh, I think I think there also would also be a rating. My goal is to keep the driver's vision. That's the number one priority. From what I understand about the ride sharing business, it's always the providers of the of the service, the drivers who are in short supply. So whatever I can do, algorithmically, design-wise, um, financially, whatever I can do to keep them more engaged, especially when it's most needed by the riders, I should be doing that. In terms of sys design for, from the algorithm standpoint, the most interesting part, I think, would be to, to improve the algorithms of suggesting which drivers get, get routed to which riders. Because that's my bread and butter. That's my algorithm. So I'm thinking out loud here how to, how to approach the problem of uh, logistics. Um, so like, let's, let's focus on the, on the, on the matching problem. Uh, rider driver. Full disclosure, I have no idea how it works. I'm going to be making guesses, which is probably what you guys should be doing in an interview. So let's let's start to postulate it from first principles. Um, when I don't know what to say, I will start saying the most obvious things and go with the flow. The most obvious thing is that imagine I'm the writer. I'm taking my phone, I'm going to call the app. I expect some nearby drivers who are either idle or are about to complete their trip. I'm expecting them to be notified of my request, of my right yeah, request. Um, in practice, I'm almost positive the way it's going to work internally is that my right request is not sent to all the drivers in the area at the same time. I don't really want my drivers to feel like, like they have to compete for the right. I don't feel like, I don't want to design a system so that from the product standpoint, from the UX standpoint, if I'm the driver who wants to make money, I'm distracted and frantically typing, yes, yes, accept the right once, uh, once I'm about to drop off this particular passenger and I'm looking for the next one. In fact, now that I think about it, one obvious thing would be maybe a lot of drivers would actually enter this automatically accept rights mode. I'm not sure if Uber works this way. It might even be against certain regulations. But if I'm the system designer, I would argue that let's extend this. Also consider some automatically accept rights until, I don't know, T plus two hours, 5 p.m. So obviously, if I'm the driver, I have a good rating, I have a good car, everything fits. Uh, the platform, if the platform knows, my default is to accept the right. It's like with Airbnb. If you have instant book, 
If there's driver, yeah, I could I could put this. If it's a platform, I know that the writer has requested the write, and there is a driver available in, in their vicinity who's idle or about to be idle soon, and who has this instant book feature on, I will just send this writer the, this request and assume that the request is taken. At the start of the interview, you'll want to clarify the scope of the question with the interviewer, as Dima probably should have done here before jumping in. For example, did we want to focus on just the ride-hailing app or include Uber Eats, etc.? Are we trying to design Uber as it is now or a new improved version? If you're going to make assumptions, clarify them with the interviewer. Dima covers the functional and non-functional requirements in a lot of detail. If he was interviewing at Uber, this would probably be the right way to go because it's a very product first company and an Uber interviewer will want to see that you're capable of anticipating specific product needs and adapting accordingly. If you were interviewing at another company, such as Google, you'd probably want to be a bit quicker on the requirements to give yourself more time on your design. I think UX wise, I would say I would do it like this, like this. So we're going to be talking about the algorithm plus UX, and then we'll start drawing stuff. Uh, um, so from the the way I usually do it is I would say like life of a right. What what? What happens to the right as it progresses through the system? First of all, it's requested by a writer. And then the system starts looking for a driver. Um, let's design. So the main idea here is that I don't really want to be sending the same right to multiple drivers concurrently, simultaneously, because I don't want them to be distracted. So even if, even if uh, let's say there are no instantly bookable drivers and there are five drivers around me, I would still not want to send the request to all of them simultaneously because as a driver, once I'm seeing the invitation to accept the ride, let's say I want this driver to have 10, 15 seconds, well, five, 10 seconds to accept this ride. And they don't need to compete with each other. So like, if I'm the driver, I'm dropping you off and someone else is about to take a ride from, from near where I am. And I'm seeing the notification. Hey, there's a, there's a person next to us, Mark, who needs a ride. As a, I would like to design the UX and the flow so that once as a driver, I see this notification, I have the next, let's say seven seconds to decide if I accept this ride or no. For the next seven seconds, once it was sent to me, this request, this request is potentially mine. It's not being routed to any other driver. So either I accept it within, let's say, seven seconds, or I don't, in which case the system finds the next potential driver. So let's say we're going to have a two-state, two two-tiered process. If instant book not available, pick a driver nearby, ML AI for selection, send them the request, Wait, I don't know, seven seconds. Go to <laughs> up. Find a driver. I'm being nerdy here. If a driver is found, if a driver who accepted is found, go to pick up. So imagine there are no instantly bookable drivers yet. I pick a driver, I send in this ride request, I wait for seven seconds. Uh, if, if no confirmation within these seven seconds, I'm going back to here, in which case I'm looking for the next driver. An instant book gets priority. If an instant book driver is available nearby, I would say same thing, but I give them like four seconds instead of seven. If no explicit rejection. 
Is this idea clear? I just made this up. It could be totally off. But the, my point is that if you have people who, who, are, who are in this hot standby mode and they, they are committed to accept every right, I give them like four seconds to say no. And if those guys are unavailable, I book a person who is not auto-confirming and I give them seven seconds to confirm. Now we get to the pickup mode. Um, so to be honest, in terms of sys design, our job is mostly done here. Pickup is pretty much Google Maps navigation, so Waze or Apple Maps. I don't think we need to design this. We can use a third-party app. Of course, if we're a company such as Uber, we have our own mapping technology and and uh, drive-in skills. What I serving capacities? What I think we should mention here explicitly is the location is shared in real time. Moreover, maybe tweaked to allow for uh, traffic lights, uh, curbside pickup details, etc. Because I can totally imagine the first version of Uber to be using, let's say, some standard Google Maps application. And then I can totally imagine some standard-ish failure modes when, let's say, a tiny road is one way, and you probably want to be picking up the, the rider like 10 meters to the north, because that's where it's easy to pick up this, this person. So it's, it's a separate conversation. I don't think we should go there. It's, it's a bit too low level. But fundamentally, in the pickup mode, until, uh, until the match has been confirmed, until we know both of the GPS uh, coordinates of both people, of both phones, and until we know that the, the driver has started the ride, we're still in the pickup mode. Pickup mode. Pickup mode. Uh, can still cancel from either side. Might be for a T. And uh, um, we, in, the, in this case, if we cancel, go back to the starting point. Once approved, once the write is confirmed, go to in write mode. Confirmed includes, but is not limited to, GPS manual confirmation by the driver, perhaps driver, perhaps a code. I know there's a feature when, oh, uh, there's a feature when uh, in certain locations, in, in, in certain jurisdictions, you don't really trust people to trust each other. So the platform needs to confirm that it's it's actually the, the, the correct writer got into the correct car. And the way Uber solves for this is they have a code, like a four-digit code, a QR code. So the, the writer needs to share this with the driver. And only once that is confirmed, the, the ride can start. Um, yeah, I think I think this is mostly taken care of. I could go I could go on with the part where you like leave a tip or something, but I think we're good enough. What do you say? What would yeah, you say? We're good. Shall we shall we get to shall we yeah. get to drawing? Let's start designing. Yeah, I think I think we we've, we've covered a, enough there. Um, do I have? Oh, these are apps. Do I have pictures? Okay, fine. I have a rectangle. You work at Mirror, so you should have everything, right? I know, right? Well, it's a personal account. It's it's a free version. I have a lot more uh, okay. labs enabled. So um, I'm going to start from the writer, which is the user, because I think it's it's where the flow mostly, it's, it's where the more most intense flow uh, happens. Uh, all right, sys design, diagrams and boxes. There are many ways to approach this. And honestly, I, it's been a while since I was doing this as a candidate. But a lot of times, so the, the first high level question to ask is, are we, are we using any cloud provider like Amazon, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft, Azure, something else? Or are we, bare, are we totally bare metal, like our own hardware? A good design is, of course, agnostic to this, but it's worth mentioning that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something like this. I'm going to have a dashed rectangle. 
should be far thicker, by the way. Yeah, that's like my cloud. Oh, next click. Uh, the way it always happens, the first box inside this thingy is a load balancer. A lot, of people, a lot of people miss what load balancers actually do. So it's a, it's a cluster, which is traditionally denoted by having a couple of them. Yeah. LB cluster. I think I can skip to back. Uh, the way it works is my request hits one of the instances of this load balancer. Can make it thicker. Um, in the case of Uber, it's not that important because extra, let's say, two, three hundred milliseconds latency, extra like 0.3 seconds, would not make things very different. But realistically, what you want to do is you want the request from the user to enter your private network as soon as possible. So load balancers are not only used to to shard your your backend servers so that you can you can add more of them. They also serve to, to make sure that the end user device, the request from there enters my system as soon as possible. And whatever network calls happen behind the scenes, they happen within my own network, which is controlled by me, which is low, which is low latency, high throughput, far more reliable. That's what the load balancer does here. Then it would fundamentally, uh, there's a big thing to say, to be said here about uh, geo sharding. I'll get there in a moment. So fundamentally, I would say, like hypothetically, this could this could literally be something like uh, I can do a text right. This could literally be api.uber.com, hypothetically. That's that's the resource where the request comes to. If 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 it's HTTP, it's of course HTTPS to be safe and secure to be not interceptable, at least not easily interceptable. Now, behind the scenes, internally, it should still be next to the arrow. Behind the scenes, internally, what happens is, I would argue, uh, for many reasons, load balancing and regulation, different cities have their different, have their own uh, shards, have their own specific sets of, sets of servers to serve these cities. So it's like a per location Uber server. What I'm doing here is I'm starting to get some work of routing the traffic done on the load balancer level. Because once you, once the writer, once, once my phone talks to the load balancer, first of all, the phone knows where I am. I assume there are some GPS coordinates. I, so if I'm in Austin, it knows I'm in Austin. If I'm in Singapore, it knows I'm in Singapore. So the request to the load balancer, even, even if it hits the same endpoint, the same high-level, top-level endpoint, there's enough metadata for the load balancer to already decide that I'm drawing multiple of these because they also shard it. They know that the request will go to, let's say, um, Austin. I'm not sure Austin has Uber, by the way. So we can say it's... There was, an, there was a new article a couple of years ago that, that wasn't, that is, it doesn't. So let's say it's New York, New York. And let's say, keep, keep dragging this thingy. And let's say there is something else, which is San Francisco. Why not? Let's say it's, let's say it's Berlin because we're international. So the load balancer at the moment, it needs to make a decision where to pop, where to pass this request to, it can decide which, which, which Uber location it goes to. And there could be, like in Europe, there could be GDPR rules. So for example, per location data for Berlin cannot leave Berlin, cannot leave Germany. Um, I cannot comment on this right now. I just, what, so far, the only thing I'm saying is that the moment the, like my, my request, my tap gets to the actual backend service here, it's already tied to a particular location. I think it's fine. Now, this, this is a tricky part. When people draw multiple things, multiple boxes, like, like I did here, it means a couple of things. One thing it means is that if one of them dies, the system is still up and running. 
That's called high availability, that's called resiliency, that's called durability. Well, durability is mostly about not losing the data, but still, we need multiple of this so that one of them can die. And then once, once we commit to having multiple nodes, um, it's a very, it's a very delicate conversation how to, how, how to proceed here. Because in terms of the system design architecture, logically, we can treat this as a single box and then decide how to best make sure it runs in a way that is highly available. So nodes can die, but it's still f functional and durable. So that once nodes, once nodes die, they don't uh, lose any data. So let's pretend for a moment logically that the whole Berlin is served by a single, ser but by a single instance of an Uber server for Berlin. Uh, as a high profile engineer, I would actually go as far as saying that it's not impossible because the total amount of traffic to this server when it comes to, <laughs> okay, this, this, this deserves, this warrants drawing. You have the so-called ride path, which are the mutations, state changes. And you have the read path. That's immutable requests. For example, when I'm just opening the app, I really, I literally want to see how many cars are there available. I don't need to go to the right path. I can go to the read path. And read path is super easy to scale because that's what, that's where strong versus eventual consistency comes into play. Read path can be eventually consistent. If I, if I literally open the, the Uber app to see how many cars are there around me, if my data, if the data I'm seeing is three, five seconds behind, heck, even 30 seconds behind, the product still doesn't suck. It still fulfills all the requirements. So the truth is that this is super easy to scale because it can, can be eventually consistent. Whereas the right path can be eventually consistent. The right path is where potential data races, collisions happen. On the, on the read path, if, if both of us open the app in the same location and we see slightly different pictures, that's okay. On the right path, if both of us order a write, we get to different servers here. You get to server A, I get to server B. And somehow these servers are not in line with what's going on. And the same driver accepts a write from both of us. That's a disaster. That's a catastrophe. That's what should be prevented. So logically, the write path is where this single source of truth, sing singular like mutex log, so to speak, synchronized section. That's where it happens. Uh, so I'm going to put it here and say should be synchronized. Single source of truth. And so one of the most difficult problems of system design is how to how to build synchronized source of truth systems that are distributed. But logically, for now, we can we can pretend there's a single machine. And again, as a high performance person, I know it's possible. If you if you take all the read path queries, these these guys, if you take them out of scope for now, if you if if you pretend there is enough machines that are only eventually consistent, they can be behind the wall time, they cannot be up to date. They might be like five seconds, ten seconds, fifteen seconds behind the actual state of the fleet. Uh, we ignore them for now. They just work. That's not difficult. For the right path, I'm going to claim that the total number of requests for new rides per second within the whole city of Berlin is going to be quite small. If you look back into all the state transitions, so you go to, we have pickup mode, find the driver mode, then we get the in-ride mode, etc., etc. Then you can have to confirm the ride, then you may like leave a tip. If you look at all the state transitions, that needs to be correctly synchronized with, with one another. That needs to be that need to be respecting the invariants, such as no writer can no driver can accept two writers at the same time. I'm going to claim that for a single city of Berlin, the number of mutating queries per second is actually quite small. It is certainly way under one way under one thousand. I just cannot possibly imagine that on the right path, in terms of synchronizing drivers and writers, you order more than one one thousand writes per second. So that's actually something one machine can handle. Uh, in practice there will be more complexities here. Let me try to explain this in this limited amount of time we have left. In practice, 
So the read path is a picture of all the cars available, so to speak. The write path is the write write to driver matching state machine synchronization. We also have something in the middle, which is synchronizing specific data. Uh, the data specifically particular right. Let me explain, that's important. Uh, I believe Uber has this feature, share my right. So I can, as a writer, I can request a ride, get matched to a driver, get matched with a driver, get into the car. It's a ride to the airport, and I want my peers, my wife, or whatnot, to not be worried. So I can share them, I, I can send the link with them, right through the Uber app, so that they can watch in, in real time where my where my location is. Of course, internally, even if you don't share your ride, Uber backend services absolutely do know where every driver, rider, pair is. The point is, this potential component, this guy sees a lot more traffic. If, if the state changes, such as write requested, write canceled, write started, write ended, for this, I believe the traffic would be quite small. For the whole city of even New York, it's likely under three digits, maybe, maybe low four digits. For this, that for the data specific to individual rights, the QPS is far larger because like in a perfect, in a simple terms, you can imagine that let's say every five or 10 seconds, the car, the driver, uh, updates their position, their coordinates connecting to the server and back. So the traffic here, th this is the most, ex the, mo the most important part, thing to keep right. This is where conflicts can happen. This is where we need to maintain the invariant when the same driver cannot pick up two riders. This, here the traffic is manageable by even a single machine. Here we have a lot more traffic. Even if it's, let's say, every five seconds there's a beacon from every single uh, driver currently driving for Uber or waiting to pick up someone. And for every single rider who is at least waiting for the ride or in the ride, there can easily be thousands of these driving live. So you, you can easily get tens of thousands of requests per second here. But the trick is, for this part, you don't, you cannot potentially have the data from one right colliding with the data from, from the other right. There's no conflict. There's no, there's no path. There's no room for, for conflicts. There's no confusion. You can break your, your, your logic invariance here, but not here. So this, basically what I'm drawing right now would be, logically speaking, the different subcomponents of, uh, of this per location. of this per location Uber server. So this is a fleet of servers. I've, I've plotted a couple of them. I would argue that in practice for this logic, but actually let's start from, let's start bottom up. For the, for the read path, you can add as many machines as you want. They just subscribe to the feed, feed of internal updates. And uh, it's like a CDN more or less. To get, to get a snapshot of, of which cars are currently available in, in Berlin, you get to one of many of these nodes and you get the data that, that is somewhat accurate. You just scale this as necessary. I would argue there could be dozens of them, maybe five, five to 10 for Berlin, maybe 15 for New York, maybe 50 or 100 if you don't write your code correctly, but that's, that's a large number. For these things, you need us a large number of them too, but each, so th these nodes are all identical in logic. They are all interchangeable. They're all fungible. If one of them dies, you just replace it by a new one. Uh, they, they all serve the same purpose and have the same date. For this logic, um, if one node dies, what happens is you shard the traffic from your riders, drivers, and active rides. You shard this traffic so that a particular data point in a particular time goes to a particular server. You can use consistent hashing to send it to, to, to two or three machines just to make sure if one, if one dies, the data is never lost. But honestly, that's not important because if, if a machine dies, well, what's the worst that can happen? For the next, I would say, half a minute, you lose track of this beacon, keep alive messages of where the driver is. No big deal on, on a company scale. So this is also straightforward, although you need to work on your sharding properly. For this part, you need to be super careful. If you're a ninja engineer, if, if your Uber is a startup that just needs, needs to launch somehow, I would sincerely suggest that we just have a single machine for the whole Berlin that, that handles this. 
If it dies, until it restarts or until a new machine starts on a backup for a couple seconds, no new writes can be requested, no new writes can be confirmed or canceled or whatnot. But in practice, if, you're, if you are the big Uber itself, you don't do it on a single machine, that's too dangerous. We have a few of them. The standard technique is to use data reductions, have, a, have an odd number of machines. Stand, uh, traditionally, it would be three or five, so that they always are in touch with each other. They always know which one is the, is the main one, whose, whose word matters most in a democratic setting. So that if one of these machines dies, if it's not the leader, that's okay. It's, it's, it's replaced and kept up to date. If the leader dies, within a split second, another leader is elected, and they guarantee that all the invariants we need to, requ- we need to respect are being respected. That's my high-level diagram. Dima has laid out a very convincing high-level design and explained his thinking clearly throughout. One potential area of improvement is at senior level, a lot of focus is put onto protocols. Dima mentioned HTTPS in relation to the connection from the user's phone to the load balancer and beyond, but he didn't mention WebSockets. He would have done well to mention there should have been a persistent connection open from the driver's phone and the rider's phone, sharing the location coordinates. Using a single API call to achieve this would have been wasteful. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I wanted to uh, ask you, what metrics are you going to be tracking here? Like, how are you going to know if the system is behaving as it should do? Oh, that's a big question. There are, there are tons of directions. There are tons of ways to postulate the question, actually. So, like, bottom up as an engineer, I want to make sure that my system is up and running. So I would look at, I would look at the traffic numbers everywhere. Traffic numbers here, traffic numbers to every single location, traffic numbers from within internal systems to all these components, all these three. If any of them drop, something, something is wrong. That's something I can totally, totally monitor myself. As a, as a higher level sys designer, I would also argue we need to track user facing metrics. I want to know how many rides are currently taking place. I would imagine the, the, the office, like imagine Berlin has an, has an Uber office. I don't think it's the case, but it doesn't matter. I would imagine there's going to be a large screen to monitor real time metrics with tons of charts. There will be like active real time number of number of rides happening right now. There will be like this daily sine wave because there's more at night than in the afternoon. And if suddenly it goes below what you would expect or above what you, what you would expect, this should trigger an alarm, an alert. Somebody should look into this. I would look into the length of the rides if the traffic pattern has changed. I would look into the ratings of drivers and riders. Are we, are we clearly, like, are we not deteriorating performance for the end users? I would absolutely look at more fine grained metrics such as like average distance from the rider to a driver, average pickup time. Because in practice, this is a very high level picture. In practice, there's going to be tons of A-B testing behind the scenes. If my engineering team has designed a new machine algorithm that is presumably making pickups faster, chances are it's being A-B tested for parts of drivers. And I want to see how it, how it performs, how it behaves, so they can make educated the decisions on how to roll it out and when. So yeah, tons of cool stuff. Thank you for a good question. Yeah, thanks for the answer. Um, also, yeah, just before we wind this up, um, are there any other kind of features that, that you think might be interesting to add and, and how, how would they affect your design? Um, yeah, let me reflect. Let me look back at this. As, as I slowly exit the mode of someone who was interviewed and I enter the mode of the like, interviewer, hiring committee member, um, I think I've, I've tried to give your listeners the best possible experience of seeing how the, how the real interview looks like. In practice, if I'm being interviewed like this, I would absolutely ask, what are we designing for real? Because nobody designs Ubers these days from scratch. Either it's a smaller startup, so that it's, it's not a, dupe, a replica of Uber, but rather some, some more targeted niche product. I don't know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a rickshaw pickup. Maybe they are allowed to use pedestrian roads. Maybe they have drones. Maybe they have extra regulations on what what business advantage they have compared to the Uber itself. In which case, the design should absolutely be focused on this particular tailored, like tailored down mode. On the other hand, if you really need to design Uber, well, I can, I can guarantee you as someone who's in the industry for a long time, this is not how Uber looks like. On a high level, yes, but as we all know from Twitter and Elon Musk, 
high-level whiteboard designs have little to do with what systems look like behind the scenes. So for the, for the interview conversation, I think that's approximately what I would imagine candidates should draw when asked this question. But if I'm interviewing, given I'm like a couple levels above the senior staff level, I would probably be having a more product-first conversation. I think I managed to strike the balance and actually talk about consistency, about data flows, about databases somehow. But yeah, it's, it's a really big can of worms. And if I can leave you with one thing here, you got to read your interviewer. You got to figure out what this particular company is looking for. Uber in particular is well known, Uber as a company, is well known for looking for uh, product first engineers. Like if you actually talk to the, to your interviewer about, Hey, I need to optimize like curbside pickup. I need to suggest pickup spots because that's where riders are more happy to be picked up compared to other pickup spots where they complain, like they, they were, they were honked at. This is super useful. This gives you tons of bonus points for Uber. For other companies, do your homework. But yeah, tons of ways to go from here. Dima gives some very useful advice and insight here for those of you with interviews coming up. So let's recap quickly. Be sure to clarify at the beginning what problem you're trying to solve. In this case, are we designing Uber or a new improved Uber, for example? Generally, the more senior your level, the more product first your approach should be. But try to figure out what your target company is looking for. Uber is known for hiring product first engineers, but that's not the case at every company. This is where doing mock interviews with ex-interviewers from your target company can be very helpful. You can do that with our coaches at igotanoffer.com. Dima, yeah, I think we can we can finish it there unless uh, there's anything else you want to you want to comment on or you, any other advice that you want to give to the viewers. Um, well, I'm still in the in the excited mode. So I I would say one thing I did not do and you guys should is talking about databases. I've deliberately avoided the topic because the high level the high level picture trumps uh, the choice of like SQL versus NoSQL and stuff like that. But fundamentally, yeah, I do hope it's helpful. Uh, pleasure spending time with you, Tom, and all the best. Hello, really hope you found that useful. If you did, you can like and subscribe. And why not come visit us at igotanoffer.com. There you can find more videos, useful frameworks and question guides, all completely free. And you can also book expert feedback one-to-one -one with our coaches from Google, Meta, Amazon, etc. Thank you and good luck with your interview.